Okay, so welcome. My name is Marcel Bruch. I'm from Darmstadt University of Technology, and I'm yeah going to I'm the project lead of the Eclipse Code Recommenders project. First, let me start. Who of you is reading source code on a daily basis to understand how APIs work? Okay, so almost everyone. Who's using code search engines? Not so many. Anyway, so the talk is for you, for those guys that have to read source code to understand and how to learn APIs. Um, the talk is called Code Completion on Steroids because what I'm going to show you is a way how Eclipse IDE will change in the next year in a significant way. But let me start with um, an example from a different domain which I pretty much like to, to explain what Code Recommenders is doing, which is Amazon. I guess all of you have bought a book at Amazon, right? Who did not? Okay, typically there's always one person in the room who did not buy a book at, at Amazon, but this time I'm no one. Okay, so what I like about Amazon is that whatever book I'm looking for, there have been a hundred or even thousands of people who bought this book before. And what's pretty cool about that is these guys also wrote reviews about the book. So if you read the reviews, it feels like having the bookseller behind you saying, this is good, this is bad about the book. And you can make a pretty well-informed decision if this book is what you want to, to have or not. The amazing thing about Amazon is that it basically does nothing about this um, to provide this information because the information is coming from its users. So you have the users who write the reviews, you have um, the transaction Amazon leverages to show your related items, other books you want to see or might bought, and they just provide the platform for everyone else to share the information with them. When I started programming a few years ago with Eclipse, so Eclipse 2.1, so I was I'm using Eclipse since eight years roundabout, I think. Um, I, start, um, I bought the first Eclipse book that, uh, that has the best ratings, and I took the book, I read it from cover to cover, and then I started hacking in Eclipse. But a few hours or a few days or months later, you get into the internal details of JDT, of PDE, and things like that, and there's the book no help anymore. So you don't have the information how to use the internal APIs because it's not documented. So you have no information how to use that. And then you lean back and say, wow, hey, how cool would it be to have a book, a, a system like Amazon, but just for code? So a tool like this telling you, okay, come on, dear developer, I know you created a text widget and you want to call the set layout method because everyone else in a similar situation did it like this before. Or you extended a preference page, then you want to call uh, override the create contents method and perform okay because this is the way how you have to extend this API. So this is the common pattern everyone else is doing. So have a look at this. And that's, that's the basic idea of code recommenders. So in one sentence, we are Amazon, but just for code. Um, so let me give you an example of uh, in what, what we mean with intelligent code completion or code completion on steroids. When you trigger code completion here on this text widget, what proposals do you want to see from your code completion system? Any ideas? Well, let's do it differently. What you get is this. And these are 164 methods of text. And it's pretty, um, well, there are methods like wait, set editable, is enabled, and things like that. These are all methods you don't need because you have created a text widget and now you need the information how to configure this widget, but not what's possible, uh, potentially possible. Now you might say, well, SWT might not be the perfect API, so we looked at the big brother, which is uh, Swing, and there on J button, and the J button looks like this. Oops. I would say, well, it's pretty, uh, well, not, not too much better than before, right? So, but let's get back to the example. What we want to see here in this case is just this. Three methods saying, you want to call the set layout data method to determine how this widget is displayed on the screen. You want to call maybe set text to get some default text. And you might add a modify listener to the text widget to respond to some user events. But that's the basically, um, that's all you need to, to create a working text widget. And this is what I would like to show you in action. So here you have this text widget stuff. So the same sample as before. And if you trigger code completion, you really get these 164 methods. So this is a pretty, pretty large list here. And what we do now is, when you trigger code completion a second time, you get the recommendations which are relevant for your task at hand. So the system looks on uh, what you have done with the text widget before, where you are using it, and uh, adjusts its recommendations based on the current context. And if we use this tool, say we just start a little bit coding here, we call this text widget, and we continue um, to add more stuff. 
um, then you see that whenever we enter a new, new item here, that the proposals slightly increase in their probability. So for instance, the modified text listener um, increased by a few percent because it learns what we have typed so far and it proves its recommendations based on this information. What you also noticed is, or maybe did not notice, that it's working instantly. So what we do is whenever you press save on your editor, it analyzes your source code and updates um, the internal model of your code. And if you then trigger code completion, it makes these new computations in just 30 milliseconds. So it's pretty fast. It's not doing any harm in your usual way of, of developing an eclipse. So let's add a modify listener here, say new modify listener, and um, decide to try to, um, working on this one. You, here in this case, we, we, now we change the context. We are not in the create contents method anymore, but now we are in, in a um, modify text method. So code completion again proposes you all methods which are potentially invocable on this instance. But what you need in this case is only this. It's get text. Because every else, uh, no, all the other methods doesn't make sense anymore. So that's the only information that's reasonable in this context. And well, this is how code recommenders work, uh, or code recommenders intelligent code completion. So we, we did a small user study in a university in asking students to use that tool and to provide some feedback about its usability. And they said, well, that's, that's pretty cool. But actually, what was um, quite helpful too were these code templates. So you know SWT code templates? So for instance, you have things like saying button. And um, then you get these snippets here on the right saying, OK, you want to use this button? Well, this is a common pattern how to use that. And this is pretty, pretty interesting and, and helpful for people that start to learn the API. So we said, well, OK, um, this is pretty nice, and people like that. But there's a common problem with these things. So for instance, if you want to use a table viewer, um, SWT says, well, hmm, sorry, it's, it's not an SWT stuff anymore, so I have no templates for this. But if you can recommend a single method on an object that you want to call, how far are you then away from recommending complete sets of methods? So in this case, you can say, well, I know that all the people that want to create a text widget, uh, a table viewer in this context, typically do it like this, saying, I'm calling these methods and um, so calling um, set input, set label provider, use look, hash up lookup, etc. And so this is a pattern, this is a template that you can use. So it's not necessarily the perfect one that you actually need in your case, but it gives you a well, um, a perfect pointer how to continue with this table viewer. And we call these things um, interactive or dynamic tem templates because they, like, some, like, like code completion, update their recommendations based on what you have done so far. So for instance, here you see um, that it now recommends calling set, set input and set label provider because it has observed that this is uh, missing in your current template. OK, so how does it work? So I think it looks, looks nice and fancy, but how do we get these recommendations done? How it works in a nutshell is we have a framework, for instance, SWT, JFace, or whatever, and we have a plenty of, of example applications that use these APIs. So in Eclipse case, you know, every widget that has some UI stuff in doing there, it uses SWT under, under the skin or JFace. And so we have tons of example applications. What we do then is we analyze these applications and extract some facts how they're using the, JFace, the framework. So for instance, which classes they extend, which methods they override or call, and things like that. Then, depending on your problem, we put all this information into a mining algorithm saying, um, and, and hope that we get some kind of recommendation model at the end saying something like, well, if you extend the class A, you want to call the method C because this is the information that we have seen in the data. So how does it work for code completion in particular? So what we have is basically a huge table which encodes code information. So for instance, um, methods, so where we are in, and which methods we invoke on a text widget, for instance. And then we have these example applications, these gigabytes of examples, and then we're just uh, doing a static analysis, going through each method, saying, OK, we are in the create contents method, put in a one, we instantiate a text widget, and we call the method set text on this, uh, this text widget. And then we put in the ones in there, and the zeros in the remaining places. 
And this is what we do for every method. So for instance, for the perform OK method, we do the same, saying, OK, we are in perform, uh, perform OK, and we call the method um, text get text. And so this ends up in a, in a pretty huge uh, table with all this information how people use the text widget. How can we get these recommendations from this? Well, let's assume that you have your own code, like here in my page, and you created a text widget, and you trigger now code completion. What the system gives you is some kind of an incomplete vector saying, OK, you are here, you called the constructor, and now tell me, system, which method should I call? So the question mark's in here. So the idea is pretty simple. What you do is you take this vector and you start comparing it to your code base, saying, OK, how many examples look similar to them to, to what I've known so far? And this is what we call the best matching neighbors. And then we look on how these objects um, have been used by others. So for instance, you see that two of three called the method um, set text, one of them set font, but none of these methods called the get font method. And that's how it works in a nutshell. So in the background, we're not using these huge kind of uh, data tables. We are using Bayesian networks, which encodes the, the probabilities pretty, pretty easy and pretty fast. Um, but this is the, the basic concept how code completion works. So let me go to, to another kind of uh, code completion that we frequently want to use. So who of you is using IntelliJ? Two guys. <laughs> Eclipse committers. OK, I see. Um, well, there's some fancy um, code completion in, in IntelliJ, which is, I call it the call chain completion. Uh, so one scenario, maybe you know that, or similar situations. You want to get an instance of a status line manager inside of you. What is the call chain, or which um, steps do you have to perform to get an instance of this? What you need to figure out on your own is that you have to call get view site, get action bars, get status line manager, and then you have the instance that you need. So you have really to make four or three hops to get an object that you actually want to, to use here. And this is something that, that is pretty, pretty challenging if you're using these APIs the first time. Um, and it's that, pretty, uh, this, this, uh, that difficult because if you look on this, just the type graph, um, you see that it's getting pretty complicated just in a few steps. So you have, in the first level, you have four types you have to check, then you have eight, 10, 12, or 15 and 20 and more. So it's really um, pretty challenging to figure out how to do that. And what IntelliJ does, and what now also Eclipse does, is, well, it's basically, It's basically doing this in an automated way, saying, OK, you say here you want to have an instance of this, and you just trigger code completion and let it search for you the API jungle, the API graph, to figure out what's going to happen and how to use that. And it's in there. That's pretty simple, right? So there's no big deal about that. It's working pretty, pretty well and pretty easy. And this is what we are going to deliver to Eclipse JDT 3.8. So we are working with the JDT team. Um, they, uh, for 3.8, they are changing their way the API stuff so that we can ship in more and more of the tools we are working on into the JDT. And this will be exciting for the next generation of Eclipse. Anyway, um, this looks nice, but there's a problem in there. So in some cases, you don't get one, uh, one path, but potentially hundreds of paths, or say at least dozens of ones. And here is where code recommenders comes into play again. If you know, if you see that there are 20 or, or 12 or dozens of different ways how you can get an instance of a selection service, and you have a user who's going through this list once and saying, okay, what I want to use is this third one, but nothing else. There's some kind of feedback that you can take away for the next user, because it seems like that the third one was that important or the one that you actually needed in your context. So next time you can present this path on top and the other ones, maybe you can filter them because you have known that, uh, learned that no one is using this one. So what we do is, uh, or currently working on is, we record your clicks and how you use this tool to provide feedback for other developers. So we create updated systems that learn which call chains you want to use and um, deliver these models back to your, to your users. Okay. Um, sorry. Next tool, totally different uh, thing. So as you have noticed, we are a university project. And we are currently trying to get more and more universities bringing their nice tools back into, into Eclipse, into their IDEs. 
Um, because we think, so for instance, the call chain stuff has been developed in 2006 by a few guys in 2005, so there's a big history in, in innovative tools that have been developed in Eclipse for Eclipse, but never made it into Eclipse, um, into the Eclipse Foundation or in this course. And I think that with code recommenders, we have the big opportunity to get other universities and such innovative tools into Eclipse again. So what we are trying to, or we're striving for, is to get people, to get universities um, collaborating in this kind of project. And the first university that joins these efforts is the Queen's University in Canada. And they have a tool which they call SnipMatch. And SnipMatch is a template store, basically. Templates in Eclipse, we have around about um, 42 Java templates. So things like iterating over an array, uh, lazy setters, getters, or whatever. Uh, and for SWT, we have around about 35 templates. So now you can start thinking, well, for the whole language, we have 42 templates. For just a single framework, we have 35 templates. We have nothing for JFace. We have nothing for whatever API that comes into your mind. Um, so you see that there's a um, a big gap for, for, other ling for other templates. And this is the knowledge that we have collected over seven years in Eclipse. On the other hand, we have snippet repositories, things like Snippler, GIST, CodeJava, JExamples. Who's using these kind of tools? Well, someone must use them. <laughs> um, but there are plenty of them. So I just made a small study and I found dozens of these kind of websites that present you templates. What you want to have is you don't want to go to the web page and figure out what you need. What you want to have is a tool that says, well, you can instantly query the database in your code saying, okay, this is the code snippet I want to have, something that, like that reads a file for some settings or whatever, and this should be tightly integrated uh, and conveniently be used by, by your users. So, and this looks like, oops. This might look like this saying, okay, you are in your own class and you trigger now code completion slightly different and saying, okay, I want something with file. And now you see it's instantly filling your, your code completion window by templates, which looks similar to what you've entered so far. It's, it's working like, like a text search, like uh, you use it in, in a web page. Um, you just give a short description of your template and then you can scroll and you can go down and see what uh, the system offers you. And um, it instantly in includes this in your code and gives you a feeling how your code would look like. And if you enter, then you get some information, yeah, you get the, the whole code that you need and things like that, so it's really filling the code for you in, in your situation. What it also has is some kind of community feedback stuff, saying, um, you see these thumbs up, thumbs down, comments, markers, or whatever, so you are able to give feedback on the quality or to improve them and doing things like that. So what's possible with this kind of approach is creating something like a community store, allowing everyone to share templates for JFace, for SWT, for your own APIs, or for um, APIs that your customers want to use. So this is a pretty, pretty interesting thing here. Okay, so... Another tool I would like to show you is user-driven Java docs. So we had a Google Summer of Code project this year. Um, we had one student who was doing a pretty, pretty tough job on getting um, a new kind of Java doc viewer. And let me start with documentation. So who's keen about writing documentation here in the room? No one, that's for sure. But this is an example for a pretty, <laughs> this is an example for pretty cool documentation. So what's in there is um, a quite, quite uh, comprehensive explanation what do unload is actually doing. It says, well, it rolls back a transaction, it clears various lists, and I should notice that super do unload is not called because this would result in several strange operations. This is something that gives me a quite good understanding what the method is doing. The problem is it's calling super do unload and you say, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think there's a mismatch between your documentation and reality in your code, right? So this is, um, well, this is at least documentation, but it's not good anymore. And this is one of the, the biggest problems you have in documenta writing documentation. It soon gets outdated. It's um, in imprecise, you, and you don't want to write that, right? So if you are a clean coder, one of the most uh, frequently cited things that you have, uh, you, you, 
um, get to know from your students is saying, oh well, clean code, they say, don't write documentation, but use speaking method names and things like that. If you try this in your business, I'm pretty sure your team will get back to you and say, come on guys, your documentation rate is, getting, uh, is, is going that um, down, so you have to write documentation, so it's not possible. And say, okay, well, if I have to write some kind of documentation, we are smart, we are software developers, we can generate that. And, um, well, there are pretty cool tools out there that do this for you. So, for instance, one of the tools I've uh, noticed is JAutodoc. And what JAutodoc is doing is there's a field called number of questions, and it generates the speaking comment saying the number of questions. I said, wow, cool. Um, from a method called set number of questions, it creates sets the number of questions and throws illegal argument exception, throws the illegal argument exception. You say, wow, cool. That's pretty helpful, right? So um, what I'm saying is if your team lead wants you to create documentation and your personal bonus payments are depending on this kind of documentation, do it. No problem with this. But you see that's really not helpful, right? So it's obvious. And you say, oh, okay, this... this uh, is documentation, but it's definitely not high, high quality. But what's really killing me was the, the user comments I've seen on a web page saying, okay, um, first one said, wow, exactly what I needed. I said, okay, well. Second one said, thank you, this plugin rocks. And my personal favorite is number three saying, works perfectly, smarter than I expected. <laughs> I said, what the heck? What did you expect, man? That's, that's pretty, wow. You say, okay, I'm sorry, I can't let this. This is not the way how we want documentation to work, right? So, and here's how Code Recommender is coming to rescue. We did uh, a small study saying, okay, how many people overwrite methods, uh, or um, start differently, JFace framework has run about 2,000 methods which can be potentially overridden, and 600 of them have been actually overridden by clients. From these 600 methods, only around about one quarter has been documented as being overridable. So JFace is doing uh, a perfect job in saying these methods may be overridden by clients, should, must, or must not, or whatever, and to give you a good feeling um, what you should do in these methods. But you see that there's a gap of uh, around about five, 500 methods where the developers have no ideas how to do that. Uh, should they override it? Should they extend? Should they uh, keep their fingers off this method? I don't know. And the, the first question we had is, can we help these guys and working on these APIs. And let me start with an example here. When you're subclassing a dialogue, this is the code Eclipse generates for you. And you wonder, okay, where should I put my code in there? In a constructor? Maybe, you don't know. Um, what you do then is you start reading the Java documentation. And what Javadoc gives you is basically two pieces of information. The first one's saying a dialogue is a specialized, specialized window. And the second one is saying dialogues are usually modal. And a lengthy explanation what modal actually means. But after reading this, you sit there and say, okay, but what are the hotspots? So where should I put in my code? I have no idea. And what you do now is you go through the whole code completion list, figuring out which method sounds interesting. You read the documentation, um, but you have to do this for potentially all 65, 50 methods to figure out uh, what you should overwrite or not. And well, this is not the way to go, right? So the same as we did for code completion, learning how others used an API, we could do the same for, for this kind of problems, so generating extended documentation. So for instance, we can create a tool, a widget, or some kind of an extended Javadoc viewer saying, if you extend from a dialog, then you want to call uh, override the create dialog area method, because 94% of all users are actually doing this like this. Or you might override uh, configure shell method because it seems to be uh, valuable in many cases. So this is giving you the pointers you need to learn quickly about this API. And not only you, but also your customers. So this is the point I want to go back. So it's not only for your teams, but also for people that create frameworks. So it gives you a valuable feedback for how people are using your APIs, but also helps your users. Or you might give some information like, if you overwrite the add pages method, you should call the method add page and maybe the super implementation, but you don't have to. So these are just simple statistics. Um, another thing you can do, and there we get back to, to mining, we can create some kind of subclassing patterns. So sometimes there are different ways on how to extend an API. You might overwrite a single method, you might overwrite two or three methods together, and this is what you can easily figure out. 
um, by using clustering techniques and saying, okay, the common pattern here that almost everyone is doing, 80% of the people is overriding the compare method in a viewer, but 20% of the people are overriding category and sort, so totally different patterns. So you might decide what's better for your, for your current task at hand, but at least I can give you a pointer. And this is one of the tools we are currently working on, and we are working on uh, this together with the McGill University also in Canada, and this is, I think, a pretty amazing project. If you have example code, it's pretty simple and pretty easy to extract interesting code snippets and directly, directly integrate this into your documentation. So for instance, if you're overriding create dialog area method, you can show him a potential pattern that all the people are using, or most of the people are using, and you keep, I can give simple code templates and snippets in your documentation, integrate them, allowing people to learn more quickly how to do this. And let's get back to snip match. You can also integrate these templates into your code completion. So you see all these tools we are working on fit greatly into your code completion, into documentation, into bug detection, all these things we are working. So this is, um, I think if you, if you read source code, the most common use case is to figure out how to use an API. And with tools like this, you don't have to, because there have been hundreds of people before that used the, that extended the create, uh, create dialog area method, and so they can help you on learning how to use this API. Another thing is that these documentations are frequently scattered over different resources, Stack Overflow, Google Code Search, and things like that. So what we also achieve with this extended documentation platform is we integrate this knowledge into your IDE. And this looks like, um, this, looks like, like this at the end. So there's one common window um, that joins all these resources that we have. And this looks like, like this, saying, okay, let's get back to my dialog and put your pointer over the create dialog area method. And here you see this new pop-up window that gives you the standard Java doc information, but also gives you the subclassing directives, gives you, um, for instance, code snippets and things like that. So this is what you get by just um, using simple machine learning techniques on example code, how others use these APIs. I think that's, that's amazing. That's pretty, um, a pretty big boost in, in your productivity. Okay, let's get to a slightly different topic, code search engines. Only two guys are using code search engines here in the room. But again, I think there's a good reason for this. Um, just ask yourself a question. How many code search requests do code search engines have in a minute? Just to give you a pointer, Google Web Search has around about 700,000 requests per minute. Uh, Facebook has about the same number of status updates. Twitter has run about 100,000 uh, tweets per minute. How many search engines requests do you think have engines like Krugel, coders? How much? One. Oh, well, that's pretty pessimistic, right? Okay. Well, the number is 20. Okay, so one is not that far away. So there has been a study of analyzing coders logs in 2009, so maybe the numbers changed a little bit over the years. But um, actually, the number of real search queries is pretty low. And the question is, what's going wrong with code search? So for sure, um, there are around about, say, seven, seven million or nine million Java users. And there are, I don't know how big is the number of people using Google Web Search, but I think it's pretty... Um, pretty much higher than, than code search. But anyway, 20 is too low, right? Let's get an example how code search work. Let's assume that you want to get uh, from a string over an AST parser to a compilation unit, one of the common tasks you have to do to deal with when you're using the JDT. When you put this or try to create a query for, for this code in Google, it looks like this. You say, okay, you use terms like Eclipse, AST parser, compilation unit, and you say it should be Java language. What you get is uh, the first one saying uh, it's, it's, it's Java documentation. The second one is uh, import statements. And the third one is a combination of both import statements and Java docs. And you say, oh, okay, well, that's not what you expected, right? You wanted to see source code. You want to know what's, uh, uh, how to solve your problem here. And you ask yourself, why is it not working? The first problem is that all these web search or code search engines basically work like web search engines. 
So they do a different kind of stemming, but they are text-based retrievals. So they text-based. They ignore the structure in your code. They do not consider relations like which classes you extend, which methods you override, which methods you call. So this information is hidden in the text, but it's not used by these search engines. And the query language is not that exp expressive. So you can't um, search for certain constraints in this. And the ranking systems are pretty, pretty simple because um, they don't use the inherent the, the structure in your source code, so they have a simple one, such as um, matching the words that you use and things like that. So that's pretty um, too oversimplifying the, the real problem here. What you would like to have in your IDE is a tool that automatically, automatically creates a search query from your, from your current editor. So what you want to trigger is a code completion saying, OK, uh, let's search for methods which look similar to what I've typed so far. And you want to create a query that says, well, the example should extend the editor part method uh, class. It should use an AST parser and it should define it somehow. And it, the parser should call the set source method. And it should return some kind of a compilation unit. And that's what you would like to specify here. And a sample query might look like this. So you see much more structure in here saying, OK, it extends editor part, compilation unit, uh, uses a compilation unit, AST parser. And what you're looking for is um, code snippets that define these kind of code search things. For instance, a compilation with an AST parser. This is the information that you actually want to see in the code snippets. And a search engine should accept and, and, and do that, it should help you in this way. So um, what you would like to see is a tool that basically, again, we get back to code completion, search for similar methods. And if you click on uh, code completion, you get these code examples from your local code search base or from a server somewhere else. But what you see here is you get the whole code saying, OK, AST parser. And um, you get all the information like uh, that you have to use a typecast to get this instance and things like that. So this is what you would like to have code search um, to work for you in your IDE. The interesting thing is, um, so if you click on, on, on Enter or you, you select this proposal, you get the source highlighting so that you can find these instances. And the simplest way you can do is you just copy the lines in your editor and say, OK, let's invert this here. And then you are done. So that's the basic idea. And this is one of the projects we are currently working on, creating new kind of search engines. And that you, you see that there is a need because Google is closing its doors in the middle of January. So they decided to shut down Google code search because, well, who knows exactly, but the number of users are, I think, speaking for themselves. But how does code completion or code recommenders come back it's, uh, into, into play? It's not only that we create a search engine, but it's that we leverage the information how you using the search engine results to improve the system. So what we take into account is the information as we've seen um, before. If you click on the widget and you, you open the text, then it's some kind of feedback. It looks like it was interesting for what you're doing. And if you copy something, then it was pretty helpful, right? Because you copied it and put it into your own code. And this is knowledge you can use for improving code search. So let's assume that you um, looked on the, on the second on the fourth example and you rated the sec uh, sorry, first and the fourth, and you rated the second one as being worse. What you can take away from this implicit user feedback is that Example one and four have been much more useful than um, number three, and two shouldn't have showed up at, uh, at all. So what you would like to have is a search engine that learns or improves its ranking to create a perfect ranking, saying one and four should be on top, three below, and two at the bottom. And what you can do is, um, well, just a short excourse in how ranking works in code search engines. So there's a general scheme which is called a um, zone scoring function. You have a big database with many, many documents. And for each document, you check um, how closely it fits to the query that you send away. So the query we saw a few seconds ago. Then you have features like, does it extend from the same base class? Does it use the same types? How many percent of them? And does it use the same methods and things like that? So these are features which scale between 0 and 1. And then you have weights that determine the importance of these, uh, these features. And what we are going to tweak now are, are the weights here, saying, OK, um, we want to improve the system by changing uh, the importance factors here. An example, how does ranking work? So let's assume you have three features, and we have determined some weights here, 0, 0.1, um, 
uh, 1.0 and so on. And this is the ranking that we produced here. What we would like to have is over here now doing is we um, use it from the, from a different from the other side, saying, okay, this is the ranking we would like to have, or one and four on top, three and two below. What should have been the weights look like to get this working? So what we do is we automatically determine the right ranking, the right feature weights here, and uh, do this for not just one, but for tens of thousands of queries to figure out what would be the optimal result. So we create a system that learns based on your user interactions how to improve itself. It's like Amazon. It's like Amazon that tells you which items are related to your current interest because it looks on the transactions, how you deal with search results and things like that. So it's basically the same idea, but put for code search engines. And, well, yes, it, it works um, pretty, pretty well, at least in, in, in most cases. And um, this is something that we're currently working on to make this work and maybe replace Google Code Search, at least for Eclipse projects. Application scenarios. Well, what we are doing is we create or we build a server for Eclipse. So that's our goal. For your companies, you might have a different focus. You want to use these tools for your internal use or whatever. So you can use the, the Eclipse repositories, but you can also do your own, um, set up your own servers. And if you're extremely paranoid, you can use it on your local file system. So there are many companies out there that are not allowed to use code search engine because of legal issues. So this might be an option um, do it running it just locally or inside your company repositories, where you are in full control of what, what's needed. So now you have seen different ways how we can leverage source code, your implicit feedback, how people are using it. And a subtitle of Eclipse Code Recommenders is, we, we call it IDE 2.0, in analogy to, to Web 2.0. So we leverage the user information like Amazon does, but for your IDE. How does it look like? At the moment, um, so the current state of the art is what I call IDE 1.0. So we have a user, or we have users that use their IDE, and whenever they have a problem, they go into the www to figure out what's going wrong. Hopefully, at the end is some guy who documented your issue. So, which means he's answering your emails, who wrote a blog post about this or whatever. And this is a time, a tedious, it takes a long time to figure out. What we do is, we exchange um, this more or less unstructured www by a knowledge base of many different knowledge bases for certain problems. And we enable your IDEs to share this information with this knowledge base. So whenever you're using code completion for a call chain, whenever you save your code or whatever, we can extract the information how to use an API and send it to a server. And it's not only one person doing this, it's potentially thousands of users doing this. And if we have enough data, we can start some kind of data mining to figure out these patterns you've seen so far. Code examples for your IDE and things like that. And, um, well, then we have to give back this knowledge to your users and saying, okay, improving code completion and documentation, etc. And that's what we call IDE 2.0. And this is the overall goal of Code Recommenders, going into this direction, making this happen uh, within the next year. Within the next year, so, how does it work today? At the moment, we are analyzing the whole Eclipse marketplace. So we have 20 gigabytes of data, mining all these sources, and figure out how they use the API, and we do this for Eclipse. So what we consume is P2 repositories, but also M2 repositories, and we create these models from, from this source data. The problem with these sources is that you don't have enough information for all APIs which are out there. So you need a different approach to make the scale in the large. And what we are trying to do is um, we want to leverage your IDE. And this sounds a little bit scary, but um, let me continue. First, why do we want to use that? Because you are writing the code. You are using Hibernate, and so you can share this information. And we have everything that we need for analyzing code in your IDE. So we know your project environment, so which APIs you're using. We have your source code, the context information, we are, what you're working on, object use, usages, and things like that. We have code completion events, call chain, what proposals you select. We have things like user feedback, if you uh, have some star rating, judging the quality of code templates, etc. We can use this for improving the system. And we have things like stack traces that can help us to identify common problems in using APIs and things like that. So there's a big waste of information we can leverage to make your daily life better and better. So this is what we want to do. 
we want to have a server or many servers in different companies for different APIs that um, collect information and for sure give it back to you by improving all these tools. Well, one of the things I've learned from my first girlfriend was the sentence, yours is yours and mine is mine. That's how she understood sharing should look like. And this is actually a problem uh, I see or we see. What's about privacy? Would you share with a community your API, your knowledge, how to use an API? I would like to give you an example how this works. So what we do at the moment, let's, let's assume that this is a, some code you wrote in your company. So there are things like my company controller and things you do with this controller. But there is also a mixture of APIs you're using in addition, for instance, Eclipse APIs or JFace uh, Swing APIs. If we now strip off all information that are specific to your framework or your APIs you're using, it looks like this. So if you split, uh, strip off names and things like that. And if you see what's remaining, it's the pure usage how you use Eclipse. So there's no customer specific information available anymore. So, and this is what we would like to share or what we want you to share with your colleagues. And yeah, the question is, are you still scared? Who wanna do that? Who could imagine to do this in his company? By far more than I expected. Okay, well then I should skip the next slide because uh, we are doing a team server. So one of the things you wanna use or what we hear frequently is, does it work for my IPIs too? Can I use it? And yes, you can. So we are currently working on this. We didn't manage to get the release done for today, but uh, next week. There's some kind of a team server uh, that allows you to set up the whole infrastructure that we are using for your internal companies to figure out how it works. And it looks like this. So there's a team server somewhere, and you have your development machines. And you just enter the IP of the team server to um, submit your data to this server. And as a backend, you have um, CouchDB, which collects all the data and it's based on. So that's um, pretty, pretty simple. And um, yeah, what I would like to show you now is giving you a feeling how this works for, for Android. So we have set up an example workspace with run about 100 Eclipse-based um, Android projects, which are using some kind of these APIs. So what we have written is an export wizard you can use for exporting this data to the local server, saying, okay, you have some API usage data you want to share. Click on next. Then you might uh, yeah, select which projects you want to share. Then you have the decision for which APIs you want to share information. In this case, we are pretty um, greedy. We select everything. And um, then you might exclude certain packages or whatever. So if you don't trust uh, the anonymization features, you can uh, carefully select which package you want to export. There's also some kind of depersonalization you can do. And then you say, okay, let's upload this to the server. And if you click finish, well, it's just submitting your data to your server and that's it. On a server side, there is um, a pretty simple UI. So it's, it's basically, at the moment, it's hosted in the same IDE. So you can run this in a headless server, but we integrated this here for um, yeah, ease of demonstration. And there's something I call the minimal self-hosting management view, which has two buttons. The first one is when you install it, you need the initialize CoachDB button. And the second button you need is generate recommender models. And what you have to do after this upload is just push the button. And then you see, well, it's, it's starting generating. It's looking on the data and it's starting the generation process for the old APIs that had, it, it knows in, in its uh, CouchDB. And you see it's generating the new calls models for Commons Login, Google Inject, and things like that, Twitter clients, everything that has been in the code base that we have here in the workspace. And this is the way how you can use it in your IDE or in your team server. And um, if generation is finished, we can go back to, to our own um, preference or to our own IDE. And there's a code recommenders menu item that's called dependencies. So this lists all libraries the system has observed in your workspace. And here you see, for instance, for um, content type, it has a, knowledge, um, a model generated at a certain time, et cetera, and there's some automatic updating strategies. So once in a week or whatever you con uh, however you configure it, it updates its models to, um, to improve it, it itself. And what we can do now is, for instance, for Android, saying, okay, um, let's update the model, look if something new is there, then we have to 
get, get back again, and you see, well, it's 11, uh, 14, just a, a minute ago, the model has been generated on the server side, and you see it's, it's right in your IDE. So I flip between the developer IDE and the server hosting platform, and it's just there in just a minute. And now what you can do is you can go back into, say, into some Android project. So list activity is something that you might know as an Android developer. Um, so it's here for um, Android app list activity. And you can start triggering code completion on, on this code. Or maybe there's a different example, the announcement adapter. Um, say, OK, here's a context in, in Android. And you can trigger code completion. And you see it's there. So immediately it gives you the code completion for Android. And that's what we've done just for our own APIs. You can do this for your own company, internal businesses. You can do this for, for whatever open source API you want to use. So no worries. It's pretty, pretty easy to achieve. Also, it works for, for instance, a text view. Say, OK, you want to call us a text method because, well, otherwise, a text view doesn't make sense, right? And things like that. So it's, it's working pretty easy, and you don't have to do too much work. You don't have to put too much efforts on this. OK. Um, I would like to sum up. So I just wanted to show you that it is possible. Uh, it's a two-click thing. You just have to push one button and say, OK, let's generate the models. And all your clients in your company will get um, the new updated models for your system. And it's pretty easy for you also to configure the upload to your server on a daily basis, saying, OK, every night or whatever, on program start, you would like to share the information with the central server. The mining stuff is generating the models for you. Um, you can also configure it to use a, a cron job or whatever, and so it's pretty easy to set up. But code recommend is by far more than these tools. So for um, to stay into my time slot, I have to reduce the, the demo. So you've seen this code completion stuff. There are a few more engines we are working on. We are putting this to um, pushing this to, to JDT next year. Um, you have seen the user-driven JavaDoc stuff, but I didn't tell you about smart bug detection. Just to give you an impression. If I can tell you that you want to call the set text method on a text rule with 100%, I'm not that far away from warning you if you're doing it wrong, right? So it's pretty easy to um, recommend you or to inform you about misuses in your APIs. Also, a tool we are pretty interested in or pretty excited is stack trace search. So if you're using Maven or Tycho, whenever your build fails, at the end, you get a message, well, I have a build exception. Please have a look on this wiki page. And if you go to the wiki page, you see, oh, well, nothing. Um, but the idea is excellent. If you have people that share the knowledge what's going wrong in the stack trace, on what caused the stack trace, you can create a system that helps you to quickly nail down the issue of this stack trace. And this is one of the tools we are working on. And um, yeah, I think it will be a big, big thing in, uh, when it's done. You have seen code search. You have seen how to support Android in an, in an easy fashion. And you have seen X snip, ma snip match in, um, in a short demo. So this is Code Recommenders. And Code Recommenders is not just a few guys. It's a big university project. So far, we have more than 60 students involved on this project in the last three years, um, doing various hands-on bachelor, master thesis. So this is a real. Um, Big thing. I'm thankful for all the students that put in their, their efforts. So we are currently a, three, a team of three people doing full-time research on this project. We have the guys from Canada coming to join the project and to improve. Um, so this is a really a flourishing project. And this would be the right time for moving over to the question and answer sections. And just let me tell you that it's already there. So whatever I've showed you in this demo or in this presentation, you can download this from eclipse.org slash recommenders. You can set up your own server. Maybe you need some, um, some support in the beginning because it's pretty rough at the moment. But you can use that, and you can set it up for your own teams. Thank you. Which APIs are by default supported? Um, in release 0 0.4, which is coming out next week, we support Eclipse 3.7 and um, all APIs that we have data for in 3.7. Most of the stuff is backward compatible with 3.6, so you can also use it with older versions of Eclipse. So this should not be a big, big problem. But if you need more data and support for special 
um, special libraries, you can just commit your data to, to our server or tell us where we can find your sources to support your framework. So we are um, currently focusing on Eclipse APIs. It's just a matter of we need to, um, to get the data. So we are working on uh, improving for, for the Maven repositories. There are 100 and I think 20 or 80 gigabyte of data. So this will be a big thing to get a lot more APIs supported, but this is not done. We are just analyzing Eclipse at the moment. There. <laughs> So far, we don't support any other language. That's the short answer. Um, the problem is, for sure, we need some support for adding support for other languages. So the concepts we are using are generalizable to different languages. So for instance, .NET languages, or SAP internal stuff, or whatever you, you can imagine. Uh, Python, well, dynamic languages would be pretty cool, right? Have you ever thought about supporting JavaScript with such a tool? A system that gives you some kind of a probabilistic type system saying this argument in this method is typically a button or whatever. Um, so this is, this is active research we are working on. Um, but honestly, it will take time and it will need some supporters on this in whatever direction. So if you can have more resources which we can push on, uh, on, on this kind of work, it would be nice to get some company support on this to improve it much more faster than we can do at the moment. So the concepts can be used, but they haven't been used for other languages. Okay. So the question is, how do we deal with older versions of an API? Do we make wrong recommendations? And um, this is a serious issue, so an excellent question. So as you see here in the models we generate, we have some, some version ranges. We say, okay, this model is valid for 3.6 6 to 3.7, and we only put all the information we have for this version range into these models. So yes, um, we can take care what, what's getting in there, and there's some hope that this will work out well. But you're right, I can't say for sure that it's working in all cases. But this is an issue we have to look at. What's even interesting is um, this version range is set manually. You can imagine that if you know that the API hasn't changed, you can reuse old data to create larger models so that you don't have to start from zero for every new library. So there is some active research we need to do on this. Yeah? Nope. The question is, um, do developers have to be online? Only for the time you have to update your models. Everything else is running locally. You don't need a server. Um, so extended documentation is currently requiring a server because this is an, uh, a web interaction. Um, we could think about creating a totally local one that just mirrors what's, what's on a server side for certain APIs. But this has not been done. But um, I think this is uh, an, an interesting issue. You, should, um, you could file that so that we can uh, think, think of concepts to improve extended docs and then things like that to get this locally, to completely locally. One more question. So the question is, a um, little bit shorter, Are there some, do you leverage the information that someone is an expert in a certain API? Do we rate this higher than, than a non-expert? And at the moment we don't. So we just say everyone is more or less on the same level. And so we think that the more data we have, these issues might simply um, don't count anymore. But in the case that you have just a few data points, this might be very, very interesting and important that you say, okay, this guy who committed this code is uh, four years on the project, so he knows actually what you're doing. He's doing it right all the time. So you should take care and rate this one, this patterns uh, much higher than, than everyone else. So this is what we um, think of, but are not doing it at the moment. Okay, so um, thank you very much for being here. And I will be around outside of the door. So if you have further questions, let me know. Thank you. <laughs>